Welcome to worship at Calvary as we kick off our Christmas season this first weekend of December. I'm David, I'm on the elder board here at Calvary. We're so very thankful for all of you for staying with us online for 10 months. We're also thankful for your faithfulness in watching and in giving so generously to the ministries at Calvary. The elders want to encourage you guys to join us in a special giving opportunity. Each year, we encourage those who've been blessed throughout the year by the ministries of Calvary to consider joining us in the special love gift for our pastors and staff. This is a way that we can just bless them directly for all that they've done, the sacrifices they've made, and the love that they have for us. We also have other opportunities for giving. Uh, you'll hear at the very end of the sermon about an opportunity as we look more outward outside the walls of the church with the heart of Advent as we seek to bless our communities around us. To give, it's really simple. You can just go online, you click the drop down box, you choose love gift, heart of Advent, whatever you wanna to give to, and that's easy. You can also send a check in by mail to the church office. So again, we're thankful for you. We appreciate you. We know this is a tough time. The elders pray for you guys regularly. We would love to join with you in prayer if you have anything that we can pray for and come alongside you. In fact, let's pray right now. Father God, we love you. We're thankful for this time of year as we look to the hope of the birth of Christ and to the redemption on the cross. Father, we know it's been a tough, difficult year for so many. We're thankful for the blessings in all of our lives. We're thankful for Calvary and the ongoing ministry of teaching the word and preaching the gospel and building disciples, of reaching our communities and reaching the world for Christ. Now, Lord, as we head to worship, we just give you all the concerns of our hearts and we bow before you thanking you for all that you've done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go to worship.
Calvary. Thanks for tuning in for worship and the start of our new series for the month of December, A Thrill of Hope. Uh, We're glad that you're with us. You're going to need your Bible today, and you can open up to Isaiah chapter 9. But we're glad we're together to think about the hope that Christmas brings. Uh, In the movie, The Hunger Games, President Snow, played by Donald Sutherland, had this quote. Hope is the only thing stronger than fear. What a great quote that is. Hope is the only thing stronger than fear. If there was ever a year we needed something stronger than fear, it's 2020. And I want to lead us through the text this morning that will help us anchor our hope in things that are sure and certain. We want to be a people of hope. In fact, I'm I just want to say thank you to Calvary for the ways that we've already engaged together as a church to bring hope to the world. Earlier this month, we assembled and are now distributing hundreds of Christmas child boxes that are going to go around the world. And somewhere in the world, somebody's going to open a box and say, somebody was thinking of me. And I think their hearts will fill with hope. The other project we're doing in the month of December as a church is the Heart of Advent. And this year, we're going to aim at serving our community through the school system to help support kids who are getting left behind because of all of the circumstances of COVID. It's happening in each of our campus communities that there are groups of kids who, because they're falling behind a lack of technology or a lack of help, uh, the schools have asked us to step in and provide some resources. So the heart of Advent this year is going to give hope to kids for food and the things they need for school. And I hope you'll pray about being a part of that with us because we all need hope. Hope is um, the longing for something that we don't yet have. Hope presupposes that we're waiting for the arrival of something, whether it's someone or some person, some event to occur. We're longing for something that we don't yet have. It's predicated on the absence of something we long for. But once it's here, we really don't need hope, which is why Paul said in the book of Romans, now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But We hope, if we hope for what we don't see, we wait with it, on it, with patience. We wait with patience. And hope requires a longing and a waiting. And we all need it. We all have hopes. Now, hope is different than a wish. We use them interchangeably, but if I were to say, I I hope I get a Lamborghini for Christmas, you might wink at me. Or I might say to you, I I hope I get to play in the NFL someday. You might say, yeah, I hope you do too, Tom. But you know it's a pipe dream. You know it's never going to happen. Or we might say in this very year, I hope we get the vaccine for COVID-19. Now that's a hope that's increasingly grounded on science and research and development. And that hope is becoming more and more possible But even that hope pales in comparison if I were to say to you, I hope that Jesus Christ has forgiven my sins fully, finally, completely based on his final work on the cross. And my hope is entering into heaven for all of eternity, world without end, to be with him forever in glory after I die. And what I would say of that hope is that that is so deeply rooted and grounded in reality that so far exceeds any other wish that I know that hope is going to come true, which is why we hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering because he who promised is faithful. There is a huge difference between wishing for something and hoping for something. And we all need hope that's deeply grounded. Christmas is about hope. I wrote earlier this week that for 400 years prior to Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, that obscure little town in a manger, 
No word from God had come to the earth through a prophet or in any other way. There were 400 years of silence that had been there so that the carol says, long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt his worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. That's the poetic way of saying the world was in a certain state of affairs and then hope beyond hope, Jesus Christ entered the world. There was a remnant of people in Bethlehem who were waiting for the arrival of Jesus. Probably many, many people had lost hope, but a remnant believed the sure word of God so that it was a thrill of hope to them. So after 400 years, Christ was born in Bethlehem. Now, 800 years before that, in the book that you've turned to, Isaiah chapter 2, there is another prophecy that's spoken of about Christmas. And it's this passage in Isaiah 9, 2, 6, and 7 that the early writings of the New Testament look back to and bring forward and announce to us that that 800-year-old prophecy in Isaiah is fulfilled in the arrival of Jesus. So you have your Bible. Let's read verses 2, 6, and 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of the Lord. This passage underscores the hope that was longed for for 800 years fulfilled in Jesus. We all need a kind of hope. We're all longing for it. And Isaiah said that the hope of God from chapter uh, nine in Isaiah is like light shining into darkness. There's a couple observations I want to make about this text. First of all, you'll notice that the passage begins in darkness. And in a very real sense, the first Christmas began in darkness. I I love that the Bible doesn't sugarcoat things. There's not a silver lining about everything that happens in the Bible. It's very real. And Christmas in Bethlehem for the first time could only be described as darkness. In darkness, a light shined. I mean, you think about Mary and Joseph arriving in Bethlehem and not even having any place to go to give birth to Jesus. It was a rude circumstances. No pomp, no um, majesty, simply a stable and a manger. And there, the Son of God, the Lord of all creation is born. It's kind of rude. The world was in darkness. Hey, if you follow the story to the next episode, um, There's a homicidal maniac ruling who wants to destroy, kill every baby in Jerusalem. You you say the world was in darkness? Absolutely, it was just a tragic darkness. And, And the Bible just says that's true about the condition of the world when Jesus arrived. The world understands, even to this day, that we're in darkness. We face problems. Problems are darkness. You think about the brokenness of our world. Even today, the the poverty, racism, um, sexism, broken homes, classism, people divided by economics and hatred and violence and homes that are broken. We're currently walking through COVID and watching people die all by themselves. Would you say the world is broken? We would absolutely say today, We get that there's problems, but we just don't know how to solve them. It's interesting that when Jesus 
arrived in the world, in his day, the Jews in Jerusalem knew that there were problems in the world. They might not have described the world as being in darkness, but they knew there were problems and they didn't know how to solve them. But they thought that the best way to solve problems was through politics. And that if they could just find a political leader who would eliminate oppression and undo injustice and sort of even out all of the inequities that existed in the world, the right political leader would save the world from all its problems. A little bit later in the New Testament, you get to the book of Acts, which we looked at several weeks ago. And in Acts chapter 17, the Greeks of the first century believed that education would be the way that we would change the world and fix the world. And so Athens was the epicenter for all intellectual study. And there in Athens, the Greeks believed that if we only had the right educational system, that would solve all of our problems. Hey, the world hasn't changed that much in 2,000 years. There's still a group of people who believe if we only had the right political leader, the world would be a better place. Or if we only had the right educational system, then we could solve our problems. But it's not exactly so. We all agree that we have these problems. We just don't know how to fix them. And these problems exist not only in the world, but they also are in us. So when Isaiah says... The people in darkness have seen a great light. He's not only describing the climate in the world, but each individual in our own lives, we understand what it is to have darkness in us. And Isaiah gets it. It doesn't matter what the brand of your darkness or how deep it is. The one thing that this prophecy tells us is that light always conquers the darkness. It always conquers the darkness. If on a dark winter night at my house, all my lights are on in the living room, but it's pitch black outside, and I throw open the front door, my house does not become dark. The darkness doesn't come into the house and extinguish the light. On the contrary, the light pours out of the front door onto the steps and even all the way onto the lawn because light always wins. When Isaiah prophesies, the people in darkness have seen a great light. He was describing the condition of the world in darkness, but that a light had shone on them. And that's the hope of Christmas. The second thing I want to talk about in this passage is um, not only that it begins in darkness, but something about that light is true, and that is that light is not something that comes from within us. We can't overcome the darkness of the world. So the text says there that a light has shined and a light has dawned on them. That's because we can't defeat the darkness ourselves. The Christmas story is all about God erupting in our world to bring his son into the world, the light of the world to us. And I love that Christianity is really about God coming in from the outside to lighten the world and to lighten the lives of those who call on him. You know, Christianity is not a pull up yourself by your bootstraps kind of religion. It's not if I just try harder, then that's what Christianity is about. This statement, God helps those who help themselves, is not in the Bible it's not there because Christianity and Christmas is about a light coming from the outside to shine on us. And that's why Isaiah says in verse 6, For to us a child is born. For to us a son is given. Something comes in from the outside to bring that to us. We hope in that which has come from the outside to bring light to us. And there's a principle about hope, by the way. And that is that the power or strength of our hope is tied to the object of our hope more than it is the fervency of what we might feel on the inside. It's tied to who the object of hope is. So God gave his son, God gave a child, it was Jesus, and he becomes the one who can change the darkness. 
you've watched plenty of drama, especially probably during COVID. We've watched too many, but you know, when you're watching a drama and you get to the very critical part where something's got to break in that story or drama in the TV show or movie, invariably some character, the hero says, I promise you, I'll come back for you. Or I promise you, I'll bring your daughter back. And we all cringe when we hear that because we say, that guy's going to do that? We cringe because we say, no, I've seen him in the first half of the movie. There's no way he can do that. And we say that because his promise is on shaky ground because you only have hope in the one who makes the promise. Now in the story, somehow, miraculously, it usually happens but real life doesn't always happen that way. But when God makes a promise and when the God of all creation says, no, I'm bringing light to you, we listen to that. We listen to that because God is able to do just that. Listen, that's why I love the very last phrase of this section we've read. Uh, You you ask the question, um, how do I know that the light of God that's come into the world can shine to me? How do I know that that light of God that's come into the world that is Jesus is enough to deal with the darkness of my life? So look at the very last phrase of verse seven. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. It's like, wait a minute. A child will be born, a son will be given, his name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, his kingdom will have no end. Ah, That sounds pretty serious. Can that possibly happen? And the prophecy ends with this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish just that. I just want you to hear what God's saying what he promised to do to push back the darkness of the world and the darkness of our own lives, he is able to do. So he asked the question, what is the zeal of the Lord? What does it mean that God has zeal? The idea of that word is a kind of fervent jealousy, uh, a kind of super passion, an ardor, sort of an undeterred resolve that this will happen. You see, we all need hope at Christmas, but the promise of the prophecy fulfilled in Jesus that whatever the darkness of our world is, Christ came into the world to push back the darkness and to bring his light to us, and the zeal of God will do just that. What does the zeal of the Lord of hosts look like? Like, what does it look like when God said, I am going to do that and you can trust it? like you really need to step back and say whoa watch it we actually saw an episode in the life of Jesus for those of you know some of the famous episodes of Jesus in the face of the worst possible circumstances where does the zeal the power the passion of Christ show up it's a great story in the book of John the gospel of John chapter 11 there's an account there of a man by the name of Lazarus who had died And after he had died, they laid him in a tomb and sealed the tomb with a rock. Jesus came to that tomb, and the Bible says that he was deeply moved in his soul when he stood before the tomb inside his deceased friend, Lazarus. The Greek word really doesn't do justice to this sense when it says he was deeply moved. It's the same kind of word, actually, that that relates to a bull snorting like, and you get the picture of in Jesus in that moment, seeing his friend in the tomb, a bubbling up inside of him of grief and anger that death is an enemy. And Jesus looked at the tomb and he said, roll back the stone. And then Jesus called out, Lazarus, come forth. A friend of mine said about this passage, I think the reason Jesus called Lazarus by name in particular 
is because if Jesus actually just said, come forth, everything that had died would have come to life in that moment. But he called the name of Lazarus, and sure enough, he comes forth because the light of Jesus and the hope of his power, the zeal of the Lord, is able to shout into the darkness even of a tomb and shout light into that tomb and to shout life into the heart that has died. Listen, the hope of Christmas, no matter how dark it feels, no matter what you've gone through for all of 2020, whatever you're going through, you need to know that God sent his son into the world on the very first Christmas because it is a hope that's grounded in the authority and promise of his word to us. Man, that's how powerful the word of Christ is to us able to go into the darkness of the tomb, the darkness of our soul, the darkness of our broken lives and speak light to us. Why is Christmas so filled with hope? Why can I say of my own life, it really is possible that God's light through Jesus Christ can overcome the darkness of my broken life? In the New Testament, the apostle Paul put it this way, for God, who said, let light shine, shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Christmas is about hope. It's about hope being rooted not in wishes, but in the authoritative person of Jesus Christ and the eternal promise of God that I'm giving you my son. If you need hope today, if you need hope in the turmoil of the darkness of the world and your own life, I want you to know that Jesus came for you. He came for you with a deep passion to bring his light into your life, to bring his forgiveness into your soul, to come into the darkness of right where you are and to bring his light to you. Jesus came for you. And he's calling your name. Come out. Come to me. Let's pray together. God, I pray for everyone listening to my voice right now who perhaps in the last season of their life has just felt an overwhelming sense of darkness and a weight that needs to be delivered. And I pray that we will see in the Christmas event, the arrival of Jesus, a light of the world that can overcome whatever level of darkness we're in today. So I ask by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will open the hearts of every person listening to believe that Jesus has come to be the hope of this day and every day forward for now and eternity. And may our Christmas season be anchored in the sure and certain promises of God that Christ came into the world to be our savior, to be our light, to be our life. This is what we pray for together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Dear Savior's birth Long lay the world In sin and error pining Till he appeared And the soul felt its worth A thrill
is a wonderful thing to be reminded of the great hope that we have in the arrival of Jesus Christ at Christmas. Yep. At Christmas, knowing that he came at Christmas in order to go all the way to the cross, and according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection. So his whole life was pointing to his work on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. That's right. It's the promise of one who was born to die, the one who would save us from our sins. On that evening when Jesus was betrayed, before he was crucified, he was celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples. It is this Passover meal that reminded the disciples, the people of Israel, of God's great redeeming work, bringing them out of slavery in Egypt to the promised land. And there at that meal, he took elements from the table and directed them to himself of a greater exodus. Here, Jesus says this to his disciples. This is Matthew 26, verse 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And here Jesus instructs his disciples as Luke records for us to participate in this in a remembrance of what Christ has done that we wanna remember the work of Jesus Christ in the body and the blood of his sacrifice and his resurrection. So taking bread, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat in remembrance of me. Take and eat in remembrance of Jesus. And when he took the cup, he said of it, this is the new covenant in my blood, a covenant that he made, a promise that he made. So because he made it, we're reminded today that the promise of forgiveness, the promise of eternal life, the promise of being a part of his family because of what he did for us is rooted in his promise to us. So with that in our minds, have hope as you drink this cup in remembrance of Christ. Take and drink. Amen. We pray your heart will be deeply rooted in hope for the fact that Jesus came to push back the darkness of the sin of our life and to forgive it completely by his work on the cross and that in the days ahead you will be filled with hope. Hey, let us send you out with this verse from the book of Romans. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. That's what we pray for you this week.